t-testing for two related samples. So up until this point, you've watched PowerPoints on single sample t, so like an introduction to t statistics, and how that differs from z statistics. And then also independent t statistics. And now we're, we're going to finish our um, grouping of three um, t statistics PowerPoints with t-testing for two related samples. Okay, so repeated measures designs, also known as um, within subject design or related samples or correlated sample design, those are different ways you might see it in different textbooks or research articles. There are two separate scores that are obtained for each individual in the sample. So think like pre and post test for repeated measures design. The same subjects are used in all treatment conditions, and there's no risk of treatment groups differing from each other significantly because they're the exact same person, the exact same group of people. Matched subjects design, on the other hand, approximates the advantages of a repeated measures design, but two separate samples are used. So each um, participant in the study is going to be matched one-on-one -on -one with another participant in the sample, but they're going to be in, um, in a different sample. So if I could match my 9 a.m. stats class with my 12 um, noon stats class, and so I'd be doing a matched sample. I usually try to match on relevant variables, um, age, gender, prior educational experience, um, you know, things like that. And participants don't necessarily have to be identical, but the closer you can get them to match on those relevant variables, the better. So related or correlated sample design um, includes repeated or matched samples. Statistically, they're equivalent, um, just depending on what kind of study you're running would necessitate if you're going to either use a repeated measures design or a matched samples design. And you're going to use different numbers of subjects, right? Because keep in mind, a matched subjects design, you're going to have um, people in my 9 a.m. class and people in my 12 noon class. Well, I'm going to have twice as many subjects if I'm just giving versus if I'm just giving my 9 a.m. class a repeated measures um, experiment. So giving them a pre-test at the beginning of the semester and post-test at the end of the semester. All right. um, again, structurally, it, it should look and feel a lot like single sample T, repeated measures T. The, the main difference, though, is now we're looking for the difference. Right. So we're looking for the difference between the scores rather than just the raw scores themselves. Right? So the different scores would be um, whatever that post-test score is, so x um, for the second round minus x, or raw score for that first round. And then we're also looking for the mean difference, right? So instead of the, the uh, mean, we're now looking for the difference, right? Instead of looking for the score, we're looking for the difference score. So my mean difference would be MD equals um, sum of D, right? so sum of all the difference scores divided by N. These are some of our hypothesis pairs. right? So for a non-directional or a, um, a two-tailed test, right, our null hypothesis for a related sample t-test would sound like this. Null hypothesis is this, uh, the average um, for differences equals zero, or in language, the mean difference for the general population is zero. The alternative would then be the, um, the mean difference, population mean difference, um, does not equal zero, or that something is, it could be um, greater than zero or less than zero. And then um, for a directional or a one-tail test, it would sound something like this. So the mean difference for the general population is not greater than zero, or you could say it's not less than zero, depending on which way your tail is pointing. Or the alternative would then be the mean difference for the general population is greater than zero. So again, we're still keeping with that theme of somewhere in your null hypothesis, you have to have a no word, no, not, um, things like that. And then the opposite is then true, and the alternative hypothesis is. Okay, so here's your t statistic for related samples. So you have t equals the mean difference for the sample minus the mean difference for the population divided by SMD, which stands for the estimated standard error of the mean difference. <laughs> so um, how you get the denominator, right? The, the numerator is pretty easy. Just take whatever the average scores for the difference is, right? Um, for the sample and then the, the population. And there's a couple different steps you have to go through to get um, the, the denominator, the bottom part, right? You find standard deviation of the difference and you have to find the estimated standard error of um, the difference. Okay, so again, we have a population, 
and uh, those populations um, have a different score. So again, we're not necessarily so concerned about raw scores. What we're really focused on is the difference between those raw scores. Okay? So from the population, you're going to pull a sample, and then um, you're going to test that sample somehow. You're going to give them a treatment or a medicine or a therapy, right? And then you're going to say, okay, this is what it was before, and this is what it was after, and this is what the difference is. So hypothesis tests for repeated measures design, um, the, the top part, right, the numerator of the t-statistic, again, measures that difference, that actual difference between the sample data, the sample um, average dif difference, right, and the population mu difference. And then the denominator, the bottom part, um, measures the standard difference that's expected if that null hypothesis is in fact true. Okay. And again, it still follows that same four-step process um, as other tests, right? So you're going to set your alpha and your critical regions, you're gonna, all that should feel exactly the same. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here. So we have person A, B, C, and D. So we have four people in our study. And um, we're going to say this is their weight, right? So maybe they had a weight loss um, medicine they were testing. And before the medication, person A weighed 215 pounds, and person A after the medication, so maybe they had been on the medication for a month or two months or whatever the time was, weighed 210 pounds. Right? So their weight now um, is negative 5, or they lost 5, point, five pounds. Okay, so again, um, I have it in red there, the difference. We, we care about the raw scores, but not really. What we really care about for related samples is the difference. Okay? So let's look at um, person B. So, um, oh, and when I square negative 5, it becomes 25, right? So squaring just gets rid of the negative or positive, so we can look at it at, at total points. Okay, so B um, started out at 221, and they ended up at 242, while well, they gained 21 pounds. So if I take 21 and I square it, right, 21 times 21, 441. And I'm going to do that for each one of the people in the study. So my sum of D, when I add up, 25 and 23 and 21 and I minus 5, I get sum of D of 64. Okay. And then if I square that, if I square sum of D, so 64 squared, I get 4,096. Okay. But if I square each one of the uh, differences, right, if I, if I add up 25 and 441 and 529 and 625, then um, I get 1620 or 1,620. Okay, so let's use these um, bits of information now and start putting it into the equation. Okay, so um, SD, or the standard deviation for the difference, right? So let's figure out how we can do that. Okay, um, and this, how you find SD is the square root of sum of squares difference divided by the degrees of freedom difference. So again, we're just, right now, we're just trying to find the numerator for the denominator. <laughs> The sum of squares formula should look really familiar. The only thing that we're replacing x with is now d. So instead of sum of x squared, it's now sum of d squared. Instead of minus sum of x squared, it's now sum of d squared, but still divided by n. Okay, so we have um, sum of d squared, because we found that out in the previous slide, of 1,620, minus um, the sum of d squared is uh, 4,096, and then again, we know that our sample size is 4. So I get sum of squares um, difference is um, 596. And then, so I, now I have the numerator, but I need, still need to find that degrees of freedom for the difference, right? Okay. Um, and again, degrees of freedom, n minus 1. Okay. So I have 596 is the numerator, and then n minus 1, so 3 is the denominator. I take the square root of that. And I get SD. Again, we're still just trying to find the numerator of the denominator. All this work just to find this little bitty number right here, this SD, the sum of our standard deviation for the difference. So um, SD, standard deviation for the difference, is 14.09. Um, so that's going to be on the numerator of the denominator of my T statistic, my T obtained. Okay. So now let's find SMD, right? Um, so for, to put that standard deviation difference on the numerator, 14.09 and then um, divide by the square root of n. And again, this time it's 4, right? So it gives me 7.045. Okay. So I have, um, let's see here, uh, mean difference, right, was 16. Mu difference is always assumed to be 0, so you can either leave it off or, or put it there. I was taught to keep the 0 there, but it doesn't really serve a purpose, so either way. 
So 16 divided by um, 7.045 gives you a T obtained of 2.27. Okay, so let's see if that was enough um, to uh, reject our null if we had a um, critical value of T set at 0 0.05 and it was two tail. So you have to look at your chart, right, and you should see in your T table that if you have um, three degrees of freedom and alpha set at 0 0.05, it's two tail, you get a T crit of plus or minus 3.182, right? And um, what was our T obtained, right? So um, let's see, our T obtained was 2.27, so um, we did not reject the null hypothesis. But if we did, right, we can go on to find effect size. And you usually only find effect size when you reject that null hypothesis. So again, we're gonna use estimated Cohen's D, um, or mean difference divided by standard deviation for the sample, or percentage of variance accounted for, again, taking your T obtained, our, um, our two point something number we got there, um, divided by um, T squared um, plus degrees of freedom. Okay, variability. So variability is a measure of consistency or how close the scores are to each other. Okay? And when the treatment has a consistent effect, means that it works pretty much the same for every person, the difference in scores cluster together and we say that the variability is low. But when the treatment effect is all over the place, right, it's very, very um, inconsistent, we say that we can see that the difference scores are more scattered, right? They're, some are really high, some are really low. And then we would say that variability is high. The treatment effect may be significant when variability is low, but not significant when the variability is high. So some of the advantages and disadvantages of repeated measures designs. Um, one of the main advantages is that it requires fewer subjects, right? I only have to get 20 people together and do a pretest and post test, and all 20 people will give me 20 different scores. And I can study changes over time, right? I can see if um, the students were better at using their T table after going to um, an hour of tutoring, say, right? And it also reduces or eliminates influence of individual differences because right? I'm not having to match them with someone close, I'm matching them with them themselves. Some of the different or disadvantages, though, are that factors besides the treatment may cause the subject scores to change. So maybe it wasn't the hour they spent in the tutoring center that helped them get better at their t-testing. Maybe they went home and um, they watched some I don't know, helpful videos on YouTube on, on how to find that critical value of t. Right? Also, participation in the first treatment may influence scores in the second treatment. We call this order effects. And you know this, right? If you um, watch a movie the first time, you kind of get some of the jokes and you get the plot. But you watch it a second time, wow, you get a lot more, right? You're like, was I even paying attention that first time? So just you being exposed to that treatment effect um, has an influence or an order effect on your score on the second treatment. Some of the assumptions. Um, again, observations within each treatment must be um, independent. And the population distribution of those different scores must be assumed to be normal or come from a normal distribution. And again, if you're nervous about that, pump up your sample size. Get your sample size above 30. Okay. Okay, so quick learning check. For which of the following would a repeated measure study be appropriate? A group of identical twins comparing boys or girls, evaluating the difference, or students' knowledge? So hopefully you said um, either a group of twins tested for IQ or students' knowledge tested in September and December. So one of them is a matched studies design and one is a repeated measures design. But they're both considered, um, you know, part of this chapter, if you will. Okay, true or false? A matched sample study requires only 20 participants to obtain 20 scores. Right? So think about that for a second. So we think a matched sample study requires only 20 participants to require to obtain 20 scores. A matched sample would actually require 20 subjects matched to another 20 subjects, right? So you'd actually have 40 people um, to get 20 um, data points or 20 um, difference scores. Okay, last one. As the variance of the difference scores increases, the magnitude of the T statistic decreases. So what do you think happens to that T statistic? We start messing with the variance of the different scores. 
It does. So increasing the variance, right, making those scores be all over the place more or have a greater um, inconsistency um, decreases that power of the t-statistic. Okay. As always, do your homework. Email me or text me with any questions. Um, and have fun with this chapter. It's kind of a nice capstone learning experience, and it, and it builds off of your knowledge of single sample T and independent T.